All right, everybody. Welcome once again to the Fury Cast. We're gonna get this going right out of the gate here, and uh, we'll see the uh, open to the show. You see Orndorff. Oh, we can talk about this. Yeah, we've seen we've seen this a few times at this point, so we can bring the sound down a hair, but. I'm Gene Jackson, along with Bob Anderson, and here we are for episode 12, Bob, of the Fury Hour. 1990s coming to an end. That's right. This is the end of 1990, and at the end of this episode, we're going to have our year-end awards. Very prestigious mm. UWF awards. So. Oh, look, it's the unpredictable one, Cactus Jack. Look at that. Cactus Jack against Don Morocco. So that's going to be a... So it should be a big way to end the year there. That sounds like one of the better main events we've had. Magnificent I can't predict Don what the finish Morocco. will be. It's unpredictable. Well, like I mean, you know... You'd kind of think that it somehow involve a double count out or double disqualification, but that would be predictable. So if Cactus Jack's going to stay true to form, we got to we got to do something else, right? Well, you would think. Or I mean, is Captain or Captain <laughs> is Chief J Strongbow going to come out and we circle back around to another Cactus Chief J Strongbow match? They threatened, I mean, teased a uh, Indian strap match at the end of the last one they had. Oh, wrong show, wrong show. Sorry. I knew it felt familiar. <laughs> Well, maybe now that we had a singles match that became a tag match that became a singles match, it can become a tag match again. I mean, I, I would rather see, you know, Cactus and anybody against Don Morocco and anybody, anybody besides Chief J. Strongbow. Uh, so we're just, Craig DeGeorge is back with us this week, so that's exciting. Him and Bruno are about the same height. Craig's hair looked like it's done by Lego. <laughs> His hair looks like it's done by a light socket. <laughs> Herb's hair done by General Electric. Oh, look at this guy. Oh, good. The Viking will be on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, that's better than his kindergarten picture, but that one, he looks like he's trying to look dramatic. Got some sound issues in this one, by the way. Uncle Ivan. Paul Ondorf. And in the feature matchup, crazy, unpredictable Cactus Jack tries his trickery against the 278 pound rock from Honolulu, Don Morocco. Captain Lou Albano and another look at his weird world on Captain Lou's corner. We'll answer so he's not just unpredictable now, he's crazy. Crazy. Wonder if we'll swerve ask the wrestlers again this week. Oh, the UWF hotline's up and running. Oh my. As we get ready for another great night on the Fury Hour. I love they picked it. So here's all the people at the concession stand instead of watching the matches. Every pencil neck, every pipsqueak to step in my way. And there's only one way they're gonna leave the ring is on the stretcher. Hurt. I think UWF should start to sell life insurance too. He's an awesome. UWF life insurance, yes. He's good. He is making his way to the entrance. Quite the promo man he's turned into here. I figure they heard the Viking was coming out, so they went to the concession stand. <laughs> That's what it was. We got the Viking coming up and <laughs> Hey, let's get some nachos. Nacho sales went through the roof. You know, they don't look so hot, some of them. I can't believe by this point, as many times as they've shown that graphic, they're like, hey, let's just show a picture of you without that dumbass helmet at the beginning because it looks ridiculous. But no, we're sticking with it. We're, oh my gosh, this guy's going to get gored in the eyeball. I don't know if look like this, man. I mean, as much as he sucks, I still don't think I'd want to fuck with him. No, definitely not. Yeah. I, would, I wouldn't want to fight him any more than I'd want to have to try to work a match with him. 
Right. <laughs> the referee's having to push that rope down. Like, hey, man, why don't you go through the middle? No, I'm the Viking. Oh. <laughs> what? Is this Gabe Knuckleball Schwartz or something? <laughs> I sure hope so. This is his, this is his son. Wow. A Viking and uh, you might call it the Yankee, I guess. Al Lyon with his pinch and the hat. <laughs> Bruno, I wonder, being a wrestler and wrestling so many years, you have a problem. We made the joke before about how this was the uh, trauma version of Thor. Now this is a trauma version of the Warriors on the other side. Exactly. It's apparently somewhere along the way, Herb's like, you know, this just isn't absurd enough. We need to dial up the absurdity here. What is it? What the, is he starting a lawnmower? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. He's cranking a chainsaw. He's back to the camera there. I hope. I don't. Is he trying out for Jackal? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the flip up your fur skirt at him there. That's a good heel move. The baseball player is going to wrestle with his cap on. I mean, because, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, you got to. I'm surprised he don't have his glove on. I'm hoping if he gets some offense, he'll spin that shit around like Stallone. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's what Okay. Two? Look at this. A lion who goes Okay. Um, blown so, so the baseball player gets two Ricky Steamboat arm drags on the Viking. Hats off now. Oh, Riffer just kicked out of the ring. Somewhere a young Mike Quackenbush is watching this in 1990 going, I think I can make a promotion out of this here. Baseball players and Vikings and... <laughs> they just need masks on. That's where they're. That's where they're missing out. They need some masks. You need four more guys in the ring. Yeah, in slow motion. Uh, I'm gonna say that I think every Chikara match ever was better than this. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, God, <laughs> I mean, he's just, uh, just an awesome-looking guy. Boy, he's really wrenching that arm bar there. That poor guy. I can't really hear the commentary, but I'm going to was... <laughs> I didn't expect him to bump off that drop kick. Well, he just teabagged him. He probably pissed. Here, we can ramp up the commentary if you want. Oh, that's right. I was just going to say, I'm sure Bruno's creaming himself over the physique of the baseball player. Oh, yeah. Well, it's an athlete. He called him Greg. Those arm drags he did earlier, they're good, but not as good as David. <laughs> Yeah, tremendous arm drags. The lion's trying to knock him over, but really not budging. Is he keep calling him the lion? I don't know what he, the lineman maybe? I don't know. Maybe the lineman. That would make a little more sense. <laughs> Although None that's not, not, sense, Gene. it's not a, I mean, we, uh, I mean, I don't think a baseball, that's not a baseball's position. That's a, like, umpire position in baseball, but here we go. Oh, decapitation action there. Didn't look bad. That's the nicest thing I've ever said about a Viking match. <laughs> and this is for you. <laughs> I will now drop my elbow. It will look decent. Suck it, Greg Valentine. You have nothing on the Viking. I will now pose it to fan who's <laughs> mad at me. Yeah. Look at you. Look at me. I will do my pose. It is like this. 
Oh god. Oh shit, now I'm gonna talk. I gave him the mic. Oh, he gave it away real quick. <laughs> they turned it off. <laughs> They're like, no, man. Oh fuck. What made you come to this guy? This hologram smurf, he asked me questions. I beg your pardon? I beg your pardon. I said, who is this overgrown smurf asking me questions? Why do you What's have to name, name why do you have to maim your opponents? Why can't you just go in and wrestle? Why do you have to hurt them? Because I like to hurt people. Please overeating taco squeezer, Burger King. Yes. Why don't you swim back to the corner where you came from? But I'm here for only for one thing. That's the heavyweight belt. So we get don't me have a guy who can wrestle. Uh, Cowboy Bob Orton. What would he do with a guy that could wrestle? <laughs> so, Herb just got owned by freaking Ludwig Borgo on the mic. That was. Breath of clean, fresh air, and in just a few minutes, you're downtown in the dirty stench of the city. But the exhilaration in the air makes New York City a place in itself, a place that turns an athlete on because he wants to get in there and go. New York, I love the excitement. Did he just say athlete? Brian Blair. Athlete. Anywhere in the area, Daddy. Step in the ring with the cowboy because <laughs> I'm ready for you. And with Mr. Tolis as my guide. I miss the day when everybody called everybody Jack. <laughs> you got it, Cowboy. You got it, Ace. You got it, Orton. The you can turn the volume down a little bit now. In the UWF. Oh, um, you're right, man. Exactly We're coming to New York. The Golden Greek and Big Orton. And we're going to suplex New York City right in the ground. And you. Uh oh, here he is. There he comes. Look, look. It's the bumblebee. Ah, I got him. Hey, there he is. There he is. <laughs> Fry and the bumblebee. Look. <laughs> One leg is gone. The second leg is gone. One arm is gone. The other arm is gone. <laughs> One lift. Another innovation of John Tolos. We know where Brock Lesnar got Suplex City now. He just talked about Suplex in New York City. Brock just, just pushed him together there. <laughs> what an inspiration the John Tolos is. Right here. Oh, the bumblebee died. <laughs> We're coming to New York, baby, with all our magic. put a lot of time into acting that out. <laughs> and business alone. And you, Brian, is just a stepping stone when it comes to the Golden Greek and the Great Orton. We're taking over New York, and nobody... Nobody. Oh my god, what a long winded motherfucker. <laughs> they do. They are in big, big, big trouble. Remember that. Orton. Herb must have snorted Coke and whacked <laughs> off to Tolo's promo. It's the only thing that makes any sense. He's not just in trouble, Bob. He's not just in big trouble. He's not just in big, big trouble. He's in big, big, big trouble. And that's that's a lot of trouble. <laughs> He's not in big trouble in Little China. <laughs> oh, I wonder if he's going to fuck up the superplex this week. <sighs> I mean, it's the streak of UWF at this point, besides non-finishes. At least tell me he's not going to grab the mic and cut the same promo he just did. Oh, he probably will. Look at this. Is that, is that one of the fucking headhunters he's wrestling? I was just about to say, I don't know if that's headhunter A, B, or if there's a C we didn't know about, but... <laughs> Which hepatitis is it that Orton has? <laughs> <laughs> Against the 247 pound experienced and, and one of the top wrestlers around. Big Orton! <laughs> he's got nine nicknames. You gotta start making some up for him. Like he's Cowboy, he's Ace. Big Orton! <laughs> he's already gotta get some advice from him. He's like, is that one of them fucking headhunters? He's like, who's a headhunter? I thought it was Abdullah. And of course, John Tolis has been called the 
But what we really want to know, rude boy. <laughs> I uh, I can't wait till way down the line. Did you ever see the broke ass bootleg version of Abdullah that worked for UWF at one point? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you'll see it one of these days and wish you hadn't. But, oh, Full Nelson. I've seen Giant Kamala number two. So <laughs> yeah, this guy makes Giant Kamala number two look like. Freaking Lucas. Like number one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's getting mad. <laughs> I don't know. I think I want to see Orton superplex this guy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'm getting a feeling we might even see a superplex this week. Cause, but if he does, it's going to be a fucking train wreck without a doubt. Cause <laughs> That's a big sum bitch right there. Yeah, he can't just fall off the ropes like he has been with this guy. It'll kill them both. <laughs> he's Garvin stomping him right now. Okay. He's mad. He's like, I was working the crowd. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> Everybody knows how exciting that is to watch on TV, to see some guy jaw with the crowd for half a match. In all seriousness, you know who that guy does kind of look like? Mo from Men on a Mission. Yeah, he kind of does. I know this is before Mo got in the business, but. Oh, this dastardly heel manager out there. Pulling on his chin. He's not choking him. He's pulling on his chin and his nose. This guy absolutely cannot stay out of it. He has to interfere. All right, I really want to know who the fuck that guy is. The eye area. By the way, uh, Greg, in the audience, we have a Georgia Mexicopolis who is the head of the, uh, the wrestling chatter box, a great newsletter with all kinds of great information about the going on in wrestling clubs. That States. newsletter must have said a lot of good stuff about them or something, because that's like the third time they've put that that newsletter over by name on their show. Are they just wrestling doing it to Barry Meltzer? Holy shit. Sorry, I'm trying to Google who this dude is. The guy's wrestling? Yeah. Terry Cooley. Is that Wendell's brother? <laughs> is he going to moonsault this guy? What, the, what are we doing? Is Bob Orton going to do a moonsault? <laughs> Not exactly. Oh. And the Viking wrestled Al Lion. Oh, that's he was saying Lion. Okay, Lion. Not Lionman. Oh, are we doing a bad figure four? Yes. Christ, this looks like Blair putting on the fucking I was going to say, if him and Blair in their match, if Blair tries to put him in a scorpion, he tries to reverse into a figure four or vice versa, that's going to take all night. He don't even have it hooked. <laughs> but he realizes he can't superplex this guy, so we had to invent a new finish. Oh, God. How, so, oh, that's so lame. Look at these weak-ass kicks. Tolus, you piece of shit. <laughs> Well, Terry Cooley would go on to be in the movie Bullworth and then do an episode of The Shield. Wow. So, there we are. Wildcat Terry Cooley. I mean, he would have, I mean, it'd have been easier for Colonel De Beers to give him a DDT than put him in here with Bob Orton and then Bob Orton having to put on a, I guess in his whole career, Bob Orton had never done a figure four because that was painful to watch. Well, if you call the hotline right now, me and Gina will give you an exclusive scoop. Call the hotline right now to find out the inside story from John Tolos. Oh. Where the hell's Dan Spivey been? Call the hotline. We'll tell Colonel you for Beard's like, call the hotline. I'll tell you what's wrong with this business with all these you-know-whats. <laughs> for only $2, we'll tell you which referee Colonel De Beers hates. <laughs> 
appearance when he went after the notorious Colonel De Beer. What is going on with Iceman's hair here? Like, he used to just have the two strips down the side, but he's got a lot going on now, it looks like. Look out. I don't believe us. You know, Sanders, you just wonder why he is still in the ring. Hey, Larry Sampson, I guess. Here's the Iceman. Hey. The Iceman intercepting the beers. He's trying to hit Bowles. And takes the shot. He was trying to go after Sanders. And the Iceman came to his side and knocks him down. The oh. beers is down. The beers is down. Hey, look at the Iceman go. Let's see. The Iceman. There's the. The beer says, let me out of here. I'm leaving. Iceman with his own rump buster. The Iceman's been around, and I'll tell you what, this is, this is a, a, a tremendous wrestler. He's certainly made a reputation for himself. Carson's coming out to Ice Ice Baby. It yeah, makes sense, I guess. I just like hearing Bruno try to put it. Bruno's like, he's a tremendous wrestler. He's been around. I don't have a clue who he is. Yeah. <laughs> who is this guy? What are they finding? I just like how he like seems genuinely amused by some of this stuff on here. He's like chuckling a minute ago during. So now he's wrestling the guy he saved last week. Well, I guess technically he saved the referee. Louis back to being a heel this week, I see. Yes. And that makes that makes me happy. And now hearing it from some fans who are chanting. And you know, at some point they uh they let it be known that Iceman is Larry Sampson's cousin. Because, you know <laughs> why wouldn't he be? Right. And now the headbutt because all minorities are related. And yeah, I mean, it could have just been his homeboy. It's just, that's his cousin. <laughs> From St. Louis. <laughs> oh, this promotion. Louis blonde pompadour looking tremendous as always. Like I said, I don't know what's happening with Iceman's hair there. He's got weird lines cut into it here and there. It's like yeah, like a diamond in the, in the front. He's had the two strips. And yeah, then, that's what yeah, I'm used to. I'm used to my Iceman Carson's with two strips. I don't know what all this. He's got a big blonde tuft sticking out the back. Louie can't even figure out how to pull it. It's in such a weird configuration. <laughs> right, that's a pretty good spot. <laughs> he's like, we'll do one spot. I'll put you in a headlock. And you just reach around up there and just be really confused. And then let's move on. I guess this is probably, I mean, last time I remember Iceman was like 88-ish. So I don't know I ever seen, I saw any Iceman in the 90s. No. Um, you know, he would do those odd promotions around Texas that would pop up, those Wild West wrestling. And I think he, I think he popped up on Global a couple of times in right. a later era. But not a lot. I was disappointed. He was booked to be on a show I was doing in like 98 or 9. And uh, I was pretty excited about it. And he, he no-showed. And I don't know if he literally no-showed or just the guy never really had him booked. He just threw that name out there. It's like, you know. Ah, nobody's going to have to get a hold of him to find out any different. So, You mean like when Herb had Bruiser Brody coming in? <laughs> well, except Iceman was alive, at least. It wasn't exactly <laughs> like that. But... <laughs> Same little spirit. different. little different. Look at PewDiePie landing. With all his weight, now he's... Chopping to oh. the midsection. Going up top with a big elbow. Slapping him in the gut. That's low. I don't know. That's, I, was, I was curious to see how many of those he was going to get away with for Iceman cut him off, but got in a lot more than I expected. Uh, now we got to do the... the I say, you, you know you can't can't ram a minority's head into the turnbuckles because reasons. In our feature against Cactus Jack. And here's the Iceman against Cutie Pie. Craig is all in on calling him Cutie Pie. The UWF is severely lacking in Samoans. And the kick out. 
Well, you know, Alpha turns up briefly. It's very weird because Alpha shows up with Samu in his corner, and Alpha does all the wrestling. And I don't know that Samu ever does ever wrestles. Like, so they took the oldest possible Samoan they can find. Yeah, and the one who was actually known for wrestling at the time just stands at ringside. But I know a few episodes down the line, they had Bam Bam Bigelow versus Alpha with Samu in his corner. Makes perfect sense. Look at Cutie Pie here. He's just hung in there today. As much as I enjoy Louie, this match is going way too fucking long. Yeah. That was a big chop to the right. Oh, he takes one right back. Did you hear that chop? Wow, you could hear that up to the rafters up there. There's no... Now, actually, oh, he takes another huge shot. Bruno, you only heard it that loud because you turned your yeah. hearing aid up. Wow. <laughs> the control now, doesn't he? Lands a right. And oh. Left. What a left. Oh, you really connected. Is it going to be the butt bump? Oh, no. It's there. No. Nope. Here it comes. Boom. The rumper stumper. The rumper stumper. What the hell? <laughs> What? I've heard him call it a lot of things over the years, but that's the first time I heard it, the rumper stumper. Wow, that was fucking bad. Oh, boy. Iceman, how come you came here to the UWF? I'm here for a reason and not for a season. Current of the bill. See? A lot of the bill. Yes. A lot of people don't know, but Larry, Larry Sampson is my cousin. He's not a fighter, he's a referee. So Colonel, if you don't like what goes on over here in this country, why don't you carry your oh. on? See, cause see now, it didn't become a family affair. See, blood is thicker than mud. Yeah. And when you put your hands on Larry, I'm putting my hands on you. Can you dig it? <laughs> yeah. Like mama says, it bees that way sometime. Have mercy. The king of rubber bands is now. Ice Man got all his shit in on that one. Hell yeah. Now the show's Blood gonna go is thicker than fast. mud. Oh lord. Yeah, this one's got the commercials cut out too. So no Nordic track this week, sorry. Back again with the captain's corner, and I happen to be a little bit upset. You know, wrestling fans, I vowed some time ago that I would retire from the world of managing. However, my good friend B. Brian Blair came to me and said, Captain Lou, you know what went on. You know what happened with Honey. You know that John Tolis and his man had the audacity to put the hurt on this lady. And John Tolis has to be watched. He said, Captain Lou, I know you're not in the world of professional wrestling, and you're probably not capable at your age to handle professional wrestling. However, he said, I know that John Tolis, you can cope with. And John Tolis, come out here right now. Oh, fuck I me. I tell you, in New York City, on January 9th, at the <laughs> Uh, 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 But you're one guy that does not impress me, and I'm going to keep an eye on you. What are you talking about? What's the UWF trying to do to me? What is this? A conspiracy against the Golden Greek? What is this? As he told us, week, I'm coming into New York with my stallions like gentlemen. As he dressed like a geriatric I'll tell you why they were appalled at what happened to Hunter. I take it this is how he ended up being the coach in WWF in a few months. And they said, Captain Lou, we what did Vince see this promo and be like, that's some good shit, pal. That's what I can't, I mean, like, some, so somebody in WWF, whether it was Vince or Bruce or Howard Finkel or somebody, saw this in December of 1990, and by August of 91, he is at ringside, Mr. Perfect, when he wrestles Brett the Hitman Hart at SummerSlam. I'm just, it baffles me every, every time. In New York with me. These guys are just scream. What is happening now? He's blowing his whistle, so to speak. <laughs> that would be a far more entertaining than this. That's going to be the end of you. Don't you worry about me, man. Jesus, fuck. Stand in that corner and stay there. I'm coming to New York. I'm coming to New York with my boy. And I'm coming to New York to put a little more polish on that apple. 
Golden Greek is coming. Is that kind of double on Tondro? He's coming with a blast. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you something. If you make the wrong move, it'll be the 4th of July. I said, don't worry about me making a wrong move. Don't you dare move out of that corner. You got it? I'm ready for you, pal. Oof. UWF box office. Bruno, we've got Holy some exciting shit. news. On Saturday, January the 12th, in Queens, New York... Uh, I love that, that Albano is like, at the Penta Hotel in New York City at 7.30 a.m. Like, <laughs> like, I don't think anybody would be prepared to watch this boring shit at 7.30 in the morning. Like, Cactus Jack, Bruno San Martino, Captain Lee the Golden Greek John Coley, Ivan Koloff, Ivan Koloff. My other favorite thing is I like the fact that they have Herb as the fucking post-match interview and he asks everybody the same question. Why did you come here to the UWF? <laughs> yes, I meant to point that out at the end of that interview because that's how every one of those interviews have gone so far. Why did you come to UWF? New York, New York. We're going in your backyard, Paul Orndorff. Well, let me tell you, I'm no stranger to New York. I played with the New Jersey Generals, <laughs> and everybody knew who D.D. was. That's right, Dr. Death. You, Paul Orndorff, you were a big name, a big, big, big name in New York. Well, Polly, my name overrose the Generals, the Giants, you name it, Polly. Pally, we're, we're breaking out Jackie Fargo-isms in 1990. You know something, Doc? It won't be very long that you and I are going to step into that ring in New York City. Well, let's think about it. Let's bring it all to a head, Doc. I go out and I'm having a match. You come out and nail me with a chair and walk out. And you think nothing's going to happen because of that? Well, brother, you have barked up the wrong tree, my friend, because I don't take this very lightly. I know exactly what I got to do. I know exactly where you're coming from. And there's not going to be hitting no more chairs, because if there are, I'm going to do the hitting. I'll tell you what, New York, this is a must. This is one match you absolutely cannot miss. You're talking about two of the toughest men ever to put on a pair of tights. There's a lot of hate between these two, and I think you know what has happened, in fact, between these two. It's players. hard to sell guys as tough when you mention the fact they put on tights. Like, they're the toughest guys to put on tights. Like, why don't you just say, wear mascara at the same time or something like that. Everything is going to go in this match. We ask you. Well, they put on their tutus. You cannot imagine. We're coming. The these are the like these UWF promos are the most coked out Doctor Death promos of all time. Right? Like, like, I mean, he's just, never been a great promo, but these are the most nonsensical. Just. But they're still believable because he looks like he could still tear you in half. <laughs> like, oh yeah, but just I don't know. I guess other places he had somebody kind of on the Fury keeping him on question point. For one of the UWF this from wrestlers. Dave Davidson. And tonight, that question is from oh, Paul Orndorff, oh. sent in by David Steele of Catasauqua, Pennsylvania. David wants to know the type of training program Paul uses to stay in such great physical shape. Well, I can tell you the two <laughs> things that I do, and a lot of it's preparation, David. First of all, I don't do drugs. I don't drink alcohol. And I don't lie, I either. I food. <laughs> You know, I try to stay away from the fattening and that kind of things. And and what that does, it gives you more uh, endurance when you do go to the gym. I try to work on the body parts, the main body parts, such as your chest, uh, your biceps, the big muscle groups. I try to work on them. And what I try not to do is to overdo it. I don't uh, go all the weight that I can use. I try to do uh, three you quarters. Of always the, injected the, in the left cheek. You got to rotate uh, back and forth. Sometimes you inject in the left cheek. Sometimes you inject in the left right cheek. And, uh, pretty well physical. Say your prayers. <laughs> take your vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> I was really hoping this is the one when I heard it was Paul Orndorff that it was the one where the fan asked, "I heard you died." <laughs> and he's like, "No, I'm not dead. Don't believe everything you hear, dumb shit." Just send a postcard with your name and address and question two. Ask the wrestlers. 702 Washington. Ask Street, the Greenville, wrestlers. California, don't do drugs. Okay. I don't do any drugs. Yeah, okay, Paul. He's uh, well liked, as you can see. But it's the 80s. We understand. Well, it was in the early 90s. 
He yeah. really has the game face on. He goes right to the ring, doesn't stop for the high five. He'll say hello after the match, no doubt. He'll sign your autograph. But he is very... And there he is, Mr. Wonderful, coming out to You Can't Touch This. That's just hilarious to me. Yeah, I, that's the one that makes the least sense. <laughs> Damn! Davy Meltzer, the intern, pissed him off this week. Oh, he's wearing a Dr. Death shirt. That's why, I guess. Oh. Jeez, he's beating the brakes off this poor kid. <laughs> this might be the most intense beating we've seen on UWF this whole time. Do you feel like they were ribbing this kid? Oh, it had to be. Like, like between the fucking Meltzer name and the shitty mask gimmicks and then this. You better believe it. You better believe it. You better believe it. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened with him. I don't think I don't think that Paul Orndorff will rest. I don't think that Paul Orndorff will be satisfied until he gets at Williams. And a patented pile driver. Yes, sir. Reverse pile. So that's driver. about his third pile driver of the UWF run. run. He's he's lost as Davy Meltzer to the pile driver. He's lost under this mask gimmick. I'm pretty sure he did the other mask care. gimmick at some nobody point. Does it better, and nobody's gonna get up hey, don't be mean to the black referee. <laughs> That's not your gimmick, man. Right. Do you want to have to tag team with Colonel De Beers? Don't do that. <laughs> that is not just a shirt. That has a Steve oh. Williams logo on it, and perhaps her. Yeah, maybe you could have pointed that out at the beginning of the match and made some of that make more sense there, Craig. <laughs> what are you doing in UWF? Paul, Mr. Wonderful, all of them. Paul, you look more vicious than ever. What do you have in your hand here? I'm going to tell you something right now, Herb. Nobody. And I'm talking to you, Dr. Death. What you did to me the last time I was here is uncalled for, my friend. Now, if you want to go in that ring and you want to use chairs, if you want to use tables, it don't really matter to me. Because I'm coming for one reason. And that's to end this with you and I, my friend. I don't like you. I don't like what you stand for. And I don't like what you do. So, my friend, you think about it. You split my head open right here on that. I don't like TV. you. I hate you, but I've called you friend right eight times in this it's promo. Come out there wearing that t-shirt. It'll be a cold day and you know where what? Where? That you'll get away with that. Where and what? You think about it. <laughs> oh. You think about it. Because you're the one that wanted it, and now you got it. Dr. Death, you're going to pay. You think about it, buddy. I don't care no more. Buddy, friend. I'm coming after him, Herb. This kid's coming to help him. <laughs> hey, you all right, Herbie? You need me to handle Mr. Wonderful? I, I wanted wow. to see that kid walk right through the promo shot more than anything. <laughs> coming down the aisle, the unpredictable Cactus Jack. Look at those eyes glaring. Look at the fans. Look at that new vest he's got six, there. That's six right? That's one we haven't seen on here before. He moans, he That's moans, authentic imitation. <laughs> I'd say it's his wife is pissed that he cut up her vest or her cut up her jacket to make a vest. He's getting in the ring and he will be facing in this match Don Morocco, one of the toughest competitors in the wrestling world. What a match this is going to be. Cactus Jack. Woo. A match that would probably get replayed a million times on East Coast Independence. Yeah, no kidding. So, uh, and that's the the shadow or whatever the the guy with the red mask. That's him ring announcing now. Uh, oh, yeah. So, this was another weird episode where when I uploaded it. The, ma the, the main event was missing. Like, it cut off after that Orndorff promo, and that was it. And I found two more versions of it that were the same way. That the show cuts off after, even though in the description it, it's, it mentioned this match, but the match wasn't there. So I had to search around on YouTube and find this match by itself and then splice it onto the show here. That's why it's got that weird logo in the right-hand corner because it's actually from a different bit of useless information there. Just a 
is uh, work outside the ring. It's very because you're an elite hacker and spliced it together. No, I just figure somebody's like, why do they put that stupid logo in the corner? Like, it's not our stupid logo. It's just the one of <laughs> the person I jacked the match from. He can brawl and he can wrestle. So, you know, he can do it all. So that's why this is going to be so interesting to see. So, uh, this morning, um, it's not out to the general public yet, but on adfreeshows.com, they released uh, Mick Foley's podcast where him and Conrad Thompson talked about Herb Abrams and the UWF. Oh. And so, uh, it'll be out for everyone, I think, next Tuesday. But I suggest everybody check it out. It's got some pretty uh, interesting insight into Abrams and the UWF in general. And, and Foley talked about the fact that, you know, how cool it was. I mean, everybody knows, if you've looked into Foley at all, the, the famous story of uh, him hitchhiking to New York to see Snooka and Morocco in the cage. And... In the UWF, you know, he got a chance on multiple occasions to wrestle uh, Don Morocco and eventually Jimmy Snuka as well. So uh, he's got a lot of good things to say about the UWF and, and Herb Abrams, even though he did have his share of issues over the, his tenure. But I figure stuff like that, you know, pretty cool. I mean, where else was he going to do that besides, like say, random Northeast Independence, but he wasn't going to do it in WCW or – Oh, yeah. No. Class or you know, anywhere he'd been previously. Like I said, I think maybe Joel Goodhart's tri state and some of those small places up there, but yeah, on a national yeah. scale, this is the only place it would ever happen. Are you kidding me? I said a man is dealing with a full back or what? There's a guy who needs a manager, you know, needs a little direction. <laughs> Please don't. Let's not suggest Tolos be with Cactus too. There he's. So he needs a manager. I mean, it would be nice for Cactus to have a vacation in Greece. But. <laughs> sure, he'd love to hang out with Dan Spivey a bit, but he wouldn't. I mean, if that shit's all expenses paid, Spivey's living the good life. The tag team of dangerous and unpredictable. Not exactly Randy Savage, but <laughs> effective. Morocco put him down. Can he get this? No. Try to get the pin, and look at the strength of Morocco. He knocked him clear out of the ring. He shoved him up and right out of the ring, as you say. Shows you a little bit of the power of Don Morocco. Look at this up at Cassie's desk. What is he doing? Smiling? I gotta tell you, man, I was uh, I was a fan of Cactus Jack from early, early on, but you know, watching him in this era here, if you would have told me, you know, this guy's gonna be WWF champion in a few years, you never could have convinced me of that. That's so amazing. No. I I was also, I mean, from I think my first time seeing him was world class, and yeah, just the style. Drew you in. You you couldn't yeah. not like the guy. But yeah, like when he left ECW to go to WWE, I was like, I can't, I can't see this working. I figured it would be one of those, you know, he goes up there, does some jobs, and ends up back. I figured back in ECW within a year or two. And oh yeah, because you know that was in the era when you'd seen. Dirty White Boy and Tracy Smothers and Bill Irwin and all these people get handed shitty gimmicks. They spend two or three months on superstars, then they turn into a jobber, then they're gone. And I was like, yeah, that's how this is going to play out. Or even the ECW guys, like Douglas had gone, Public Enemy had gone, uh, you know, and none of those guys had had much luck. And I mean, and not that, I mean, Douglas is a good talent, but like Foley was on, on a different level than most of those guys, but. Yeah, I just never thought it would work. And but perception-wise, you know, going in, you know, Douglas had been, you know, multi-time tag champion in WCW, and he'd been ECW champion. Like, if somebody just on the surface of what their careers had been up to that point, and they're like, okay, well, Douglas and, and Cactus are going into WWF. Who's going to be more successful? You would have had to think Douglas would, based right. on his look, based on his, you know, career up to that point. 
But then the minute he shows up as Dean Douglas, you're like, Oh yeah, he's no, fucked. No, this ain't happening. Like this is just another dumb occupational gimmick that's gonna fizzle out like a fart. Yeah, that was well, like you said, when with Dirty White Boy and all those guys, Freddie Joe Floyd, and as soon as you get Bill Saturn, as a goon hockey a player, like, come on. But I mean, you know, when when he showed up and immediately attacked the Undertaker, you're like, well. He's going to get a short run as a victim of the Undertaker. He'll get a few, you know, some paydays out of it. He'll at least, you know, earn the notoriety of having had a feud with the Undertaker. But once the Undertaker's done with him, he'll fall down the card. He'll lose to everybody on the roster. They'll spit him out the other side, and he'll have a decent career on the Indies or back in ECW or whatever, based off his short run in WWF. And right. Who could have who could have been more wrong than that? But at the same time, though, if he doesn't kill himself up there, does that happen? Yeah, it's true. I mean, but yeah, to me, uh, he's one of the first guys. You know, you've seen it since with a lot of people, most notably. You know, Daniel Bryan and most recently Sami Zayn, where the crowd latched on to him and I think kind of pushed him over the top. True. You know, and I think he's one of the first real examples of that, as you can point to him. Like, this is a guy Vince never would have made champion, but, oh, Lord, you know, the crowd made it happen. And uh, I'll never forget when his, uh, when his book come out, I couldn't put it down. Like, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but, like, I called out of work and read that book, like, in the course of, like, 24 hours. Like, it's, it's my all-time favorite wrestling book. The first oh, one. it's fantastic. You're not wrong. It's... Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right about Vince. He never... He's not the guy that should have made it. And, the, like, I don't know. The but, I mean, always it was a there. good timing thing, you know, that things were changing, you know, I mean, you think back to that time, you know, the fact that they showed footage of some of his death matches with Terry Funk on Raw, right. brought Terry Funk in and tagged them together and acknowledged his past and all that, like, you know, if a year or two before, that never would have happened. Oh, he's pulling out. He's bleeding and pulling out the hangman. Nice. Yeah. Kept his ear this time, so that's good. <laughs> and that's the other thing. You have to figure. I mean, they were doing a lot of, you know, the attitude shit, but no one was doing. You know, they'd seen the blood yeah. and they'd seen all the suck it nonsense, but nobody was doing that shit. <laughs> yeah. That's we were talking a little before we went on the air about like FMW and things like that, but nobody was doing, nobody was willing to do the things he was doing mm. or would do. I mean, when well, there we go. That's oh, uh, what was that finish? I didn't even. I don't. I don't know that we actually saw the finish, or maybe I just missed it in the as I was talking, but. Uh, <laughs> Probably a count out. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a clean finish, whatever it was, or we would have realized it. So, all right. Well, there is the very last match of 1990 for the UWF Fury Hour. And so we got the year end awards, and uh, producer Smokey has, uh, has made some graphics to pull up here. Ooh. Check that out. And uh, so he said that we can just go down the line. He said he put them in uh, what he thought to be the most likely order. So I'll see if you agree. But so the first UWF 1990 year end award, we won't say who came up with these awards. Some people might be offended by a couple of them. This might be the most offensive one to some people. Best jobber. Mm. Would you like to go first on this one? Or would you like me to go first? Uh, dealer's choice. Does it matter to me? Uh, I'm trying to pull up my list where I have them saved in my phone here. Well, I'll go first while you do that. I feel like we should alternate. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with Louis Spicoli. Okay. He uh, um, he was a later entrant, but he definitely was probably the most entertaining in my eyes. He actually got the New York, New York promo. He had the really good match with Brian Blair. 
he had the one match where he definitely led the whole thing and, you know, was doing his slipping and falling three stoogie gimmick. So best jobber goes to Luis Piccoli for me. Um, so, so we're probably going to approach these in different ways, which will make this more fun than if we just agreed on everyone. So as far as, uh, everything that you just listed that makes Luis Piccoli the best jobber, I would like to think of him not as much of a jobber because he actually got some stuff in in some of those matches, but, um, <laughs> I'm listing, uh, the bounty hunter as the best jobber because, you know, he was a jobber whether they wanted to admit it or not. And, uh, just based off that mask alone, that whole get up that he had, and the fact that we weren't supposed to know that was freaking Spitball Patterson that had jobbed every week up till then and then picked right back up afterwards. Um, yeah. Good choice. Next category from producer Smokey favorite wrestler to watch. You're up. I'm going to just be honest on this one. Uh, it's Cactus Jack. Uh, that was that has been my favorite wrestler to watch on there. As far as quality, um, I, I mean, there may be some other people on there who are favorites for other reasons, but I figured I would I'd be genuine on this answer, and I have to say Cactus Jack. That would probably be my number two choice. I'm actually going to go with Orndorff. Uh, Cactus got stuck with a lot of shit opponents. Yeah. So Orndorff was usually in there with jobbers and usually it was pretty quick to the point. He was always hitting sweet pile drivers. So like I said, I'm going with Orndorff as my favorite wrestler to watch on these shows. Good call. Can't touch him. Exactly. <laughs> Least favorite wrestler to watch. Is it like a 12 way tie here. Or yeah. Or right. <laughs> Still need to choose from, but I'm going with fucking Fake J Strongbow. Good choice. Always, he was terrible. He was fucking terrible. <laughs> I had to see that shitty war dance. I had to hear Herb talk about his fucking Chiefy. <laughs> Go Chiefy. That's the most annoying yeah, nickname. Yeah. Any had to hear Herb talk about his fucking TP. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, the big TP. Strongbow. How about you? Of. Uh, so I would have never guessed this going in because I didn't particularly dislike this guy. I mean, I never thought this guy was good. I was never a fan of his matches, but I wouldn't have called him my least favorite. But thinking back over the last few days and thinking like, what wrestler besides Colonel the Beers have I just absolutely <laughs> not enjoyed their shit? Because even the Beers, like, that one match with Billy Jack surprised me. I was like, that did not suck as bad as it should have. It wasn't good, but it didn't suck as bad as it should have. But as far as somebody whose matches just suck, there was nothing to them. I got to go Ken Patera. Oh, that's a good choice. His squashes with jobbers were horrible. I mean, he did nothing like in that match with Cole off. He barely took any bumps. It was just, just nothing happening. And, uh, so, yeah. And like I said, in the beginning, before I watched all these, I never would have guessed if you just gave me a list of wrestlers that Patera would be my least favorite. But he is. Most inspirational. I think we should come back to this category. Okay. Okay. Unintentionally funniest line or moment. I'll start this one. I believe that would be because the answer you just finished about Ken Patera, it would be when Bruno, and I don't know if I have the exact quote, but Bruno said something along the lines of, if Ken Patera wanted to, he could have a really great match right now full of fantastic moves, but he won't. <laughs> <laughs> and I think yes. he meant it because, you know, he's a, he's a heel and he could do that, but he's not going to because he's a bad guy. But we took it as because he sucks. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was like, I was like, that's a burn right there. Yeah. Like, good job, Bruno. Like, <laughs> that's some that's some new wave indie commentating right there. I mean, that's right. like something Chuck Taylor would say on a PWG DVD or Ken, yeah. uh, Kevin Steen or something. Like, I died fucking laughing and had to rewind <laughs> it. It was so funny. <laughs> All right. So, uh, that brings, oh, I didn't say mine, did I? No. Uh, unintentionally funniest line or moment, and this, I mean, you may call this a cop-out answer, but pretty much every Billy Jack Haynes promo 
to me was <laughs> unintentionally funny. Every last one of them from the little kid line to just, I always knew when he popped up on the screen, I'm like, this promo is going to be entertaining. I can't say that when the match has started, but the promos were always. I thought you were going to pick the Viking stepping over the top rope for sure. It was, it was right up there, but <laughs> I was torn on that one. That was the hardest one of all these to, well, this next one was pretty hard too, but um, match of the year. <laughs> It was kind of hard, but then again, it, it kind of wasn't. Uh, I mean, I th- it's, it's got to be my turn to go first, first, but David San Martino. Yeah, I mean, the this is the only one. this is the only category that we sort of talked about. Yeah, uh, off the air because I was like, man, I'm struggling to come up with a watchable match of the year, <laughs> much less the best match of the year. And we kind of agreed. I mean, I mean, we kind of agreed early on when the match happened that. That yeah, first San Martino Cactus Jack match was like the best match they had had, and then the next one wasn't bad. Yeah, I mean, we're not even saying it's particularly good, but no. it's definitely the best match on this of show. Of the matches. I mean, because, yeah. like you said, okay, your favorite guy to watch was Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, but you essentially watched the same match yeah, 11 times, 10 times, whatever it was. Um, and that could be said with almost all the squash matches. Hundred um, percent. That match was very uh, every Cactus Jack match, but especially the one with San Martino, was very different than anything you'd seen on UWF. It was different than what you saw on most wrestling shows in 1990, um, which and, you know to me makes it stand out. And especially because, and it wasn't like it was a complete carry job. David kept up. He held up his end. His shit looked good, which so is shocking. Exactly, because I mean, if you go back and watch his 1985, like the endless David versus Brutus Beefcake feud, it ain't good. And this David, I mean, other than maybe his 96 Nitro match against Dean Malenko, this is hands down the best David San Martino match you'll ever see. So, and you know, Foley told a story on his podcast that he ran into David San Martino years and years later at a convention or some sort of thing and they said that uh david was very cold towards him and and acted like he was you know had an issue with him to the point that finally fully just asked him he's like hey man we got heat and he's like yeah man i don't like some of the stuff you said about me in your book hmm. and he's like what did i say and he's like well you 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 wrote it didn't you you should know so he tracks a fan down at this convention that has the book and he goes and looks it up and he had put something in there about um some guy's career, um, you know, didn't take a great path due to his choices. And he said, you know, very similar to David San Martino, whose career got derailed based on some of his choices. And I mean, and, you know, he did that weird thing where he was supposed to go over on Rick McGraw and he lost to him on purpose and then quit the promotion and WWF and all that. So Foley goes back to him. He's like, hey, and he reads it to him. And he's like, this is true. Like, this isn't even really a bad thing to say about you. It's not even a nice, just a, it's just a fact. And San Martino's just like, you know, like, <laughs> like of all the awful things that have been said about people in books and shoot interviews, like that's the one you're walking around butthurt about. He just right. basically made a factual statement about it. I mean, what argument could you make about, you know, Oh no, I didn't make any bad choices that ruined my career. I mean, you're Bruno San Martino's kid. You should have had a cakewalk through wrestling, and you managed right? to screw it up to no end. I mean. All right. So next is favorite Herbie moment. You go first on this one. For me, and this is another one where I had to really mull it over. Uh, there's been some doozies. Uh but the one that I always go back to and probably laugh the hardest at is the stupid TP story. <laughs> it's so absurd. It's just, it's so absurd. I'm going to go with when he completely lost his shit on Ricky Ataki for no fucking reason. <laughs> <laughs> like just in the middle of a squash match, he goes ape shit on fucking Ricky Ataki and Japanese people for no fucking reason whatsoever. And then the next week he's like, Oh, this guy's pretty good. <laughs> like Somebody, somebody reprimanded him. I mean, it's his company. I don't know who it would be. I don't know if it was somebody with 
sports channel or his partner, you know, the business partner he still had or what. But you, because you talk about a complete 180. But yeah, yeah, I mean, you would think that we were building towards a Ricky Ataki Herb Abrams feud, the way he just <laughs> went in so hard and so, you know, just like, like, damn, this dude has done something to him. Like, that was personal. The right, next week, like, yeah, he's not so I mean, bad. Japanese people don't have gyms. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah, like there, that, was, that was some personal shit right there. I don't know what the fuck that was about. <laughs> All right. So that brings us uh, back around to most inspirational. And I, I, I have to think we agree on this. Play it. <laughs> okay. But you're going to be mad afterwards because... We sort of agree, but we sort of don't. But oh, all right. All right, let's watch the let's watch this. See how everybody feels, and then I'm going to make a case for why that may not be 100 percent accurate. But let's take a look at this. I fight for blacks! I fight for Hispanics! I fight for Orientals! And I want baby shed by black people! I still love you, little kid. Doesn't get any easier. No. So, yeah. I would say that you are 100% Billy Jack Haynes is most inspirational. Now, I see that. I don't necessarily disagree with it. However, when you say inspirational, that term means someone who has inspired people the most. So if we're going to talk about someone in the UWF who has inspired people, you're talking about the man that inspired Rob Van Dam, the man that inspired Sabu, and perhaps most importantly, the man who inspired Diamond Dallas Page. And who else could I be referring to but John fucking Tolos. He may not be the most inspirational, but God damn it, he's inspirational. AF, as the kids say today. <laughs> ah, you're funny, Gene. Oh. You're funny. Let's go ahead and reference Tortured yes. Ambition, the story of Herb Abrams in the UWF. Jonathan Plombaum, you can go to Smokey. Where are you at, buddy? Get on the ball here. <laughs> Boom, right there on Amazon. Uh, there's a link. If you go to tinyurl.com slash UWF podcast, there is a direct link. You can click on it and take you right to where you can purchase that book. A lot of great behind-the-scenes insight on UWF. We talk about some of it here, but we don't scratch the surface. No. Um, Jonathan interviewed almost everybody that's still alive that still had any direct uh, involvement with UWF. I mean, you got to give it up. That dude went above oh, and yeah. beyond to track down people who hadn't been heard from in years and years and spoke to them and interviewed them at length and uh, – that book answered a lot of questions I had about UWF. You know, I, I, we've talked about this before, and it's kind of why this whole thing exists, is because I was really fascinated by Herb Abrams and the whole concept of the UWF. There was tons of questions I had had for years and years that never got answered. There was just no means to find the answers. And then when that Dark Side of the Ring episode came around, it kind of stirred all that up in my head again. 
And then I find out that somebody was writing a book about it. And I'm like, oh, I'm getting that book for sure. And, um, uh, and it's funny because, you know, as, as much as, as you and I have talked about wrestling in the last few years, that topic never really came up. Like I, yeah. I mentioned that book and you were like, you mean, you know, this one and like you had it already and had read it. I was like, oh shit. Wow. Okay. And then fast forward and here we are, we've done a podcast for 12 weeks. That being said, what is your, so we, we gave the, you know, the awards jokingly in some cases. Um, but having watched 12 consecutive weeks of Herb Abrams' UWF Fury Hour, what is your big takeaway thus far? So in these episodes, I have played the role of the curmudgeon. For the most part, I will say that it's been less terrible than I've let on, but man, it is repetitive as fuck. I mean, it's the same eight guys over and over and over again. Um, that's my big takeaway. Like, he had a super limited roster, and they booked toward nothing. Like, the, there was no – like, you and I talked about this a lot off camera. Like, there, there, there were no house shows. There was no pay-per-view. There was no – End point. Like all the big time matches ended in non finishes and they booked toward fucking nothing. So it was just the same shit over and over again. You know, Orndorff squashes Jobber, Dr. Death squashes Jobber, fucking Orton squashes Jobber, Blair squashes Jobber. And if they put any of those guys together, it was a fucking non finish so they could go back to the same fucking thing. That's my big takeaway. It was a lot of fucking hype building toward fucking nothing. Nothing means nothing on this show. So, you know, you you admittedly said that, you know, you've you've played the role of the curmudgeon who's who's not happy about all this, you know, and, and so I have played the role of, you know, being somewhat enthusiastic and, and psyched about it. And I kinda was going in. And it didn't take me long to figure out, you know, what you just said. Like, fuck, this is repetitive as hell. But I could get past, because if, I mean, I've gone back and watched a whole year of World Championship Wrestling from 86 and 87. I've watched entire years of Mid-South and the original UWF. And even then, you get a lot of the same people in squash oh, yeah. matches week after week. But you got through that, and in the process, you had some really interesting promos, and then you usually had some sort of main event or featured match that paid off somewhere. And if nothing else, you saw highlights of where all these angles have been going paid off somewhere else. You know, okay, here's a clip from, you know, Wherever, yeah, from the Omni if it's WCW or from uh, New Orleans, the Superdome if it was you know Mid South, whatever. And so it all it was all going somewhere. And so here, it's a bunch of nothing that leads to a bunch more nothing. <laughs> like you're not wrong. Uh, if if these, I mean, we talked about this a few different times now. Like say off the show, it's like if if these this angle with Williams and and Orndorff built to something good. You're like, all right, well, I sat through all this crap, but wow, that was a really good match. And I didn't see that ending coming, but not to spoil things, but we're going to spoil some things right now. So, well, let me say this before I spoil it. Okay. So what, what we're getting to here is me and Bob, if we're going to continue to this podcast, and we want to because there are people that watch it. We get a lot of great feedback. We've had a lot of suggestions of like, hey, when y'all get through UWF, why don't you watch this? Why don't you watch that? And me and him in uh, conversations have been like, man, I wish we could do this. We wish we could watch that. And especially now that we've we found this watch-along ability. Um, so we're going to take the show and move it away from being a weekly UWF podcast where we watch every episode of UWF in consecutive order. Now, that's not to say that we won't circle back and watch some UWF episodes. We will go back and watch the pay-per-views. 
Definitely. But we're going to change the name of the podcast, change the concept of the podcast. We got a couple things in mind that we're pretty well set on, but we're not going to announce them now just to have the freedom to change our mind. Um, where we're going to look at a variety of different old wrestling. Some newer wrestling, not new wrestling, but no. newer than, <laughs> ni- the 1990 UWF, some older than 1990 UWF. And, uh, we're going to watch them along like we've been doing UWF. It'll be up on the screen as long as we can. If it becomes an issue with YouTube, we may have to do like other shows that do watch alongs, you know, like Shivani and different people, you know, they just do the audio. You have to go get the video yourself. And it may come to that. We're going to try, and that's why we're going to limit. There's going to be some things you guys suggest that we're just going to be like, sorry, we can't do that because of those reasons. Or we may have to do those as a special episode where it's like, all right, you want us to do that? Cool, we want to do that. But you're going to have to just link the audio. Like, here's an here's an MP3 file. Play it while you watch the video yourself. Um. But here's the reason that I, I want to move away from UWF. Okay, you and I and everybody watching this can can all agree the biggest angle, besides the Colonel of Beer's racist angle, has been Mr. Wonderful against Dr. Death Steve Williams. Okay, so they had their first match, double count out. They have a lumberjack match that goes to a non-finish which leads to a steel cage match that ends when Terry fucking Gordy interferes in the match and it's a goddamn DQ. That's our big angle. That's the payoff for our big fucking angle. And that was the only hope of you getting anything out of this that was building to something. And once I went back and watched that again and remember, because I'd forgotten that's how that played out. But I was skimming through some of the UWF video cassettes and I saw that. I'm like, oh, fuck, that's right. You didn't even get a finish in the cage match. Holy shit. <laughs> like, oh, my God. We're I'm like, we can't continue to do this to ourselves. So for the people who are enjoying the week to week UWF, I'm sorry. But for our mental health, for our enjoyment of life, and for this to continue on, we're going to need to watch some stuff that's a little more fun. We're going to need some variety. Biggest thing. I, I don't really, it, having done this, you can name the best wrestling that I've ever watched. I don't know that I want to sit and watch it and talk about it every week consecutively. I mean, I don't know if you feel the same way, but it's, like I said, because back in those days, those squash matches got repetitive and they pushed a lot of the same people. So you were going to see, you know, a lot of the same guys having a lot of the same matches because they had their handful of moves they did and they featured yeah. them in their match. And every Nikita Koloff, and spoiler alert, every Nikita Koloff match was going to end in a Russian sickle. You know, that's just the way it was. And every Orndorff match, you go watch him in Mid South to UWF, I mean, the WWF to down the line, WCW, pile driver. It's, it's his finisher. That's the way work, wrestling worked back then. Um, so tell everybody what we have in mind to kind of kick this off. We're going to take a couple of weeks off, um, not because we're lazy, but because, uh, we're going to prepare this. We don't want to just throw it together. We're going to, we're going to prepare this. We're going to like kind of get a game plan on things. Uh, we got to kind of get a strategy on, uh, recording these. Um, we both have a lot of stuff going on in our lives outside of this podcast that we do. My dumbass does several of these podcasts and just agreed to do another, which I shouldn't have done, but I did. Um, so yeah, but anyway, but tell us what we're looking forward to kicking us off. Once we come back from this brief hiatus. So we're announcing the first potential idea then. Yes. Not the name of the podcast or that shit. Just the, the wrestling that we're intending to watch. Okay, so as Gene was talking about all the stuff he's watched, I've been a big world-class fan for years. We obviously can't watch that because Vince owns it. I binged, he was talking about binging stuff. I binged 80, whatever they start with on the network, 82, 83, through till it got really shitty with Dingo Warrior on top. <laughs> um, anyhow, we've mentioned Global on this show before. Global is a very interesting company. They have a whole made up backstory that's very entertaining which we'll get to on the show uh so our plan is to start with the first round of the global wrestling federation television title tournament 
uh, which will encompass three or four episodes, I believe. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Yeah. With such great dignitaries as the Patriots, the handsome stranger. Um, I know Buddy Landell's in it. Gorgeous Gary Young. Lots of Texas favorites. I think Stan Lane's in it, I believe. I think uh, you're right. Um, I don't know why that sticks out to me, but but again, we're not we're not quitting the UWF to go find exceptionally good wrestling to watch. We just want to find something a little different. And our plan, like I said, not to we want to move around. We want to watch different stuff. We want to. We've well, mentioned before some wrestlers that we like. We might have a hey, it's so-and-so day and watch a series of matches from that person or we might like i said send in suggestions when we yeah start please do we'll say here okay so i will say this because the name's just you the know, name's in fluctuation right now yeah but so here but here's the concept y'all um and i have these conversations all the time uh some of my my buddies the ones that i do uh the live podcast with every sunday are 15 years younger than me and so they have very different ideas of what the best wrestling that ever happened was like they came in to like the tail end of like the ruthless aggression era on into that shit that i think is just <laughs> mediocre at best they think it's the greatest thing ever and they think the stuff that i like is old and boring and it wasn't that good and so uh a few years ago, me and a buddy of mine, Brian Trammell, had a podcast that we did like once a month or once every two months. It was called, you know, was it really that good? And we would go watch old stuff and like, is it as good as we remember it to be? And so me and Bob's whole friendship is predicated on old school wrestling, you know? So, and we talk a lot about, you know, current wrestling. And then we, inevitably, it always circles back around to the old stuff. And so then you ask yourself, especially having watched like UWF and some of the random stuff that I watch here and there, it's like, well, was it really as good as I remember? You know, is it really that much better than the stuff now? Does it still hold up? Because like, okay, you said, you mentioned Global Wrestling Federation. I'm not going to say I haven't watched any Global in the last 20 years, but most of my Global Wrestling Federation watching, I remember coming home from school and turning on ESPN and watching it because it came on every day. That was the mm -hmm. crazy thing about those ESPN shows. They were on every day. How you made that much content to me is I, I would, I want to educate myself on global in general. Like you say, the made up backstory. And also, I mean, I don't guess there's a book out there anywhere, but I do want to, in these two weeks that we're taking off working on some things, I am going to do some research on some shoot interviews or just some reading on, the real story behind the GWF, because I remember coming home from school and watching GWF. That's where, you know, you mentioned the Patriot. That's where the Patriot was born. You know, he had been the trooper in AWA. And then all of a sudden this guy, the Patriot shows up in global who they portray as the ultimate baby face. And eventually I'm sure we'll get to something he did there. That was just like only the biggest good guy in the world would do that. And then of course, you know, in later attitudes be like, <laughs> Only a sucker would do that. That was lame. <laughs> uh, but all these faces I recognize are, are showing up there over time. These people may not necessarily be in that TV title tournament, but you had Cactus Jack, and you had what I recognize to be have been Norman the Lunatic, but now he's Iranian Muckin or something. Sing now he's fucking singing, and he's dressed like the Iron Sheik. The and future you know, Raven will be there. Sweet Stan Lane. Yes, Scott Anthony, who uh, I was a big fan of in this era. Uh, I had first seen him in Memphis as Scotty the Body. He turns up here as Scott Anthony. Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert, who everybody who knows me knows. I'm a huge fan of Eddie Gilbert. My boy Hollywood John Tatum will be there. Hollywood Lightning John. Lightning Kid, who will become X-Pac, is there. Has those classic matches with Jerry Lynn in Global that kind of – put them both on the map really uh to this yep. day people still recall those matches so um i'm ex so i'm excited about that but that's going to be the question we're gonna we're gonna ask ourselves at the end of every every one of these shows is was it really that good is it as good as we remember or you know and and you as the viewers where we want the show to become more interactive and we want to build an audience and and maybe even eventually you know hopefully have a dialogue where people of you know who are maybe younger than us or older than us or whatever 
<laughs> no, um, <it's> okay. <laughs> you know, watch it and be like, okay, you just think this is good because you have nostalgia for it. You like the memory of it. You like what it stands for in your mind. But as far as standalone wrestling, no, it's it's really not good. Um, or on the other hand, it would be, you know, if we can get some younger people that just fucking like modern day WWE to go, hey, that old shit's pretty all right. Yeah. I mean, That'd they may cool come too. around and go, hey, this is actually good. I mean, because there are things that I really liked in wrestling as a kid that I watch now and I'm like, hmm. Yeah, Not as good as I go? remember. I mean, fuck, that's in general, though. Like, you know, I remember when I got not to roll this off into a whole big, long conversation. Um, but, like, I remember when I was in college, they put the, the shows of my childhood started showing up on, like, uh, TNN, like Dukes of Hazard and the A-Team and Knight Rider and all these shows that I absolutely loved as a kid. And so me and my college roommate, the first day they aired the Dukes of Hazard, we're sitting there like, oh, yeah, Dukes of Hazard, man. And we're watching it and we got real quiet for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and finally, Shane looks over at me. He's like, and I remember this to be a lot better. I was like, yeah, this kind of sucks. Like, this is dumb. <laughs> and we watched the A team and it was even worse. Knight yeah. Rider, down the fall guy, down the line. It's like, wow, it really doesn't hold up. So, you know. Curious to see, does all this wrestling hold up? Or are we going to watch it and go like, you know, it really ain't as good as I remember? Or yes, it is. And uh, I don't, I mean, I don't want to spark arguments with anybody. I don't, I don't need all the negativity that you see on, on Facebook and everything when it comes to oh, wrestling. Oh yeah, we definitely don't. I would, I, but I would like to have some genuine conversation of like, if some younger people watch it and you said, hey, they may, they may love it or they may not. Okay, well, tell me. What did you like better about this week's Dynamite than you liked about this episode of GWF or AWF or whatever we show? Whatever we're week. watching. Whatever we're yeah, watching. Definitely don't want that Twitter negativity going on. No. Yeah, no. If we could spark some intelligent conversation about it, that'd be sweet. Absolutely. And I would, I mean, and at some point, hearing some people's insight may make me appreciate some of the new stuff. I'm not a guy that goes and engages in all the arguing about it but you know from us talking privately i don't enjoy a lot of it and i'm kind of perplexed at some of the stuff that people do enjoy now um but what do they have to compare it to right. you know so like you said maybe expose them to some of this older stuff different psychology different you know outlook on it maybe it'll change their mind maybe they'll say these old guys are stupid i'm not watching this anymore and hey oh, yeah. so be in it. general we'll probably be looking at stuff from I would say 98-ish back. I don't figure we'll come much further. Yeah, I can't see us making it into 2000, really, other than maybe like some some odd indie stuff. Right. Maybe like early Brian Danielson or AJ Styles, guys like that, possibly. Or, but, or late Tracy Smothers or something along yes, those lines. Yes, but mostly we're going to go back. Uh, I'm going to expose – Bob to some of my beloved Southern wrestling. We're going to watch some continental on here. We're going to watch some obscure, like that five star wrestling shit they did down in Louisiana. Not a lot of it, but like an episode here and there. No. And then I want, I want Bob to show me some stuff that I haven't seen. And so we'll, uh, we'll all uh, watch this stuff together and we'll decide whether we think it's that good. And there'll be shows where, you know, I may say, yeah, I think that was great. And Bob's like, no, man, that sucked. And vice versa. And then that's where the audience can come in and then you can uh, settle the dispute and, and vote which way you want it to, to go. So I think it's going to be fun. I have yeah. I have very high hopes for it. And again, I'm sorry for anybody who's disappointed that. But I, I mean, I said it from the beginning. The very first episode was, will they make it through? Um, you know, we've always had our doubts, even from the first episode, that we would make it through. Because I think collectively, there's like thirty something, forty something total episodes, full episodes of UWF that are out there, and they get they don't get better as time goes on; they get worse. That's the sad part, guys. Too is like episodes one through twelve is probably some of the best stuff. There's some middle ground there where it's not too bad, but holy shit, there's a cliff that it falls off. I, I kind of referenced it earlier where they had this fake Abdullah the Butcher guy on there. They had Madman Pondo in like probably one of his first few matches and 
they had that Colonel Red guy who's just oh my god. Uh, Though we do promise we will at least come back and do blackjack brawl and beach brawl. Oh yeah, we're gonna do beach brawl. We're gonna do blackjack brawl, and we're gonna do some random episodes of stuff that I just mentioned. One just for a point of reference, and two, we're all gonna watch it. I'm referring yeah. to me, Bob, and our whoever watches the show. And then afterwards, you know, we'll say sometimes the question will be, was it really that good? And then maybe other times it'll be, was it really that bad? I saw it and thought it was terrible. Bob may watch it go like, dude, you're being too critical. It's not that bad. Or he yeah, may I mean, be like, holy shit, I'm glad we didn't stay through to this, you know. I might be like, hey, at least it didn't have fucking John Tolos. So. Um, the greatest thing about Beach Brawl is the fact that there's like, 13 matches and I think 12 of them are title matches. <laughs> like you've never seen so many championships in all your life. I mean, it is absurd. I mean, everybody is a champion. They have midgets title, they have women's titles. They have every region of the world has a title represented on the show. It's so it's insane. 90s WWF. Yeah. And I make jokes to that with me and Xander's, uh, do these watch alongs where we're mocking like recent local indie wrestling. Uh, I always make fun of the, like, the promotion should be called bring your own belt. Cause every motherfucker on the show has a belt of some description. <laughs> like, but anyway, uh, that wraps up this episode. But before we go, before we close the book on uh, UWF, I think we need to revisit the book on one- UWF the book on UWF and this sponsor promotional consideration paid for by the following karate Karate fighters you control the action dragon kick versus the red ninja thunderfoot versus skull crusher you control every punch every kick no rules no referee no holds barred just all contact karate action the man left standing rules Each set comes with two karate fighters. Get your hands on the action. I asked producer Smokey to tone that down. I think the smart ass made it louder. Um, Before we sign off from UWF for the last time, again, we'll be putting it out on social media. We'll put it in the UWF group. We'll put the new show probably coming up in a couple of weeks, but we'll tease some stuff before then. But uh, I think it's only fitting that we remind you what you've been watching one last time. Hi, I know lots of you have been surprised, but you've been watching UWF. This is true.